Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Grade Up. I hope you all are doing really well. Through the course of this lecture, we will of course continue with your 1000 question series and we will be looking at some important concepts related to your uh, literature which will really help you in your papers along with looking at your 1000 questions. So let's very very quickly get started. I hope you all are able to, I will also check it. I can I can see there's Navika, there's Devashree, there's Shweta, Samali, Sneha, Anu, um, there's Aziz, all right fantastic there's uh there's avnish avnish uh so avnish i read your comment yesterday and no one is a senior citizen everyone is absolutely equal right over here everyone's there for learning well that was very uh like you know kind and sweet of your rather your story is very inspiring the way that you know you're, you're planning to prepare for your exams at this juncture so it's fantastic and i don't really think that there is any appropriate age for learning whenever you think it is appropriate um that's when you can actually start okay let's very quickly get started with today's session and and like we are uh, immersing ourselves into positivity so I would just like to say that you know please don't compare yourself don't compare it's very normal to get really scared about oh my god the other person has done uh, English literature and has revised it three to four times whereas I've not even completed Rotelage once so don't compare your achievements or uh, like you know your study plan with others just give yourself a little bit of relaxing break also and uh, this is something that I keep on saying right just 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 avoid being perfect you don't really have to uh, uh, mug up things you don't have to literally uh, learn everything by the book even if you're having a ballpark estimate right because remember your your exam is having objective questions they are not subjective answers where you have to be perfect even if you get an estimate that yes this is the right answer you're almost sorted uh, for the paper so you don't really have to worry too much about this paper the beauty of this paper is that it is objective in nature so stop trying to be perfect don't compare yourself with others and just make sure that you're very very healthy you know the process needs to be enjoyed by everyone that is also very critical and like I keep on saying that you know you're absolutely awesome and you know there's something which is very good over here and that is it's okay not to be okay it is okay if you're feeling um, anxious it's okay if you're feeling as if you've forgotten everything it's okay as if you know you're feeling that okay I'm just having 20 days and I've done nothing at all that's perfectly fine it's very normal it's okay to think that um I'm not able to understand anything that is a part of your preparation so that is perfectly all right it's absolutely normal right but at the end of the day just remember be very very kind to yourself don't overburden yourself all that you're feeling all that you're going through is something which is very common very natural but you just need to learn how to take care of yourself you know there's something which I was taught uh, by one of my very important mentors and what my mentors told me I, I think I must have shared this with all of you also you know there's this hand you can all like you know you can just all all of you can just keep your hand in front and what you can do is you can just pat yourself at, at times you need to pat yourself for just surviving at times you need to pat yourself for just like you know getting across or getting through that day so it's not always that you know you'll be measuring okay how much did I uh, how much did I earn in terms of either money or uh, how much did I earn in terms of like you know the content that was completed that's always not how you would measure yourself that is not how always you should measure yourself so please be very kind very very kind to yourself during the preparation this is all that I want to say and like I was telling you that rather than giving you quotations I would rather like to share you know some stories you know so uh, one of the um most important reasons I'm sure all of you know about this this is actually Harvard Business School HBS right Harvard Business School follows uh, a methodology which is called the case study methodology and we literature students are so lucky because we actually go through we actually go through so many texts to learn so many beautiful things right and HBS Harvard Business School actually follows the case study methodology you know why because cases anecdotes are something that stay in our mind we're able to connect with it we're able to remember it for a very longer period of time and that is the reason I said rather than giving you quotations I would rather might as well share certain examples with you which will genuinely inspire you uh, I don't know how many of you know who this person is right uh, how many of you know who this person is okay all right yes uh, hello I can see Ima, Poonam, Tensing uh, there is Rupa there is Lalan, Priyanka uh, there is English Mania right there's Nazreen there is Sana Poonam, Gyan, uh, Priyanka, uh, okay, Liji is there, Jigyasa. Who who is this uh, that that we're having? Good evening. Ambi, Ambi, Varti. Who is this? Does anyone have any idea about this person? Of course, this person currently, because of the Chinese regime, is undergoing a lot of, um, okay. 
Geeta, it is perfectly all right. Like I said, re- like I said, absolutely, absolutely, Aziz. But who is he? Of course, he was a teacher. But who is he? He was not actually a teacher. He was the kind of a guide. Uh, but he's related to English, right? He's Jack Ma. He's a Chinese business tycoon. Uh, he's the founder of Alibaba. Alibaba is very similar to your e-commerce giant like an Amazon, right? And uh, Alibaba, of course, currently because of the Chinese regime, uh, had come down in power. But nonetheless, Jack Jack Ma's story is very inspiring. Uh, you know, he was rejected. What is really important is, you know, we always see the important position that the person is holding. But he was rejected multiple times. He was even rejected from jobs like KFC, right? And he was also rejected from jobs where, like, you know, for example, if there were thirteen people who had come and uh, only one person was rejected, and that was Jack Ma. So he was rejected multiple times, and that is when he decided that, okay, if people are not finding me employable, I might as well create opportunities. And that is how he started working, right? And uh, of course, uh, currently as we speak, he's undergoing uh, a lot. Of problems in China because of the regime, but nonetheless, he is a business tycoon. Uh, he is a person uh, who who had been once like you know one of the most important figures in China as well as across the world in terms of leading the space. And he was an English teacher, not only a teacher, he was actually an English teacher. So uh, he is having his roots associated with English, but with great amount of consistency, persistence, having a lot of faith in his abilities. Remember, he's being rejected, and rejection is not something which is very good. We don't take rejection. very very easily so but still very inspiring so keep on looking at these stories around you they're all around you he keeps on coming in papers so if you've genuinely been reading newspapers which you should ideally be reading i can't really imagine that you know you, if you've been reading papers for 30 to 50 days you would have definitely seen him you would have certainly seen him in the newspapers because of the controversy that was around him right so just learn to see around you there are so many inspiring tales from people who have just been like us or rather worse than us we're still better off in terms of getting access to education and we can genuinely climb the ladder of success so be very careful about that okay and like i keep on saying you all are one in a million please 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 treat yourself with as much uh, like you know kindness as possible that's really important so let's very quickly dive into our 1000 questions series feel free to connect on the telegram channel this particular week i'll be getting some uh, there is a set of five interesting videos which have been lined up for all of you which will help you in your preparation and they'll be bilingual videos which will be available on uh, your telegram channel so please stay tuned to the telegram channel it's neersha english ugc net and uh, i would be sharing the updates also with all of you okay on this particular channel i hope all of you are sitting with an a4 size sheet while we are looking at your 1000 questions please ensure that you are trying to capture all the details because you know these captured information will be better for you to revise if you're noting down things in a proper format it's always a better idea Than an unorganized thing, because otherwise you'll be like, okay, oh, what, what was that? What was that? Like I got a question. I think it was Anki's question, if I'm not wrong, or it was uh, someone's question had come that okay, when you told about Bildung Suma and what are the other kind of things that you had told us about? So had you noted down everything properly, then you wouldn't have had that problem at all, right? I'm not denying. I love these kind of doubts, and I would love to answer them also. But it's always a good idea to capture things down. Let's start first very quickly with uh, some icebreaker questions for today, and then. Of course, we'll continue with our one thousand question series. Okay, this is the first icebreaker question. Question number seventy. Question number seventy one. Question number seventy is very important, and I've got some elaborated points also for all of you for question number seventy, which keep on coming in your exams. Okay, so I want all of you to quickly tell me the answers for question number seventy and seventy one, and we will be discussing question number seventy at length. We will be discussing question number seventy at length. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Raja, Munmun, Talat, Poonam, Menika, Nisha. Hafiz is sui generis is of its own kind. Like William Blake is considered to be a sui generis, right? They are very atypical. They are not typical. They are not prototypes, right? They are one of their kind. So Blake is inventing his own uh, mythology, and therefore he is considered to be a sui generis. Therefore he is famously called as a sui generis. That is the Term that we are using for William Blake, right? That is a term that is getting used for William Blake. Okay, let's very very quickly see how many of you are able to answer this question. How many of you are able to answer this question? Good evening. Good evening. Okay. 
the subject of education the subject of education scholarship c is very good a very good very good very good that is brilliant that is brilliant i can see some of you have started answering the first question correctly some of you uh, have started looking at the first question correctly let's see the second second one why would you write scholar gypsy scholar gypsy is not the right answer though but anyway we will discuss the questions both the questions we'll discuss it in a little bit of detail at least the first two questions we'll be discussing it in greater detail and you know here uh, Foucault is very very important Foucault, Bakhtin these are a few writers uh, from your theory who are extremely critical who are extremely crucial from your examination perspective that you definitely have to go through so you will have to remember you will have to remember that is of course very important so please keep all these aspects properly in your mind do keep all these aspects properly in your mind okay uh, Okay, 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 okay. I, I love how all of you have answered, but none of you have actually given the, the answer that I was looking for. None of you have given the answer that I was looking for. Let's see at the classroom platform if someone's answered this question correctly. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Now, Bachi, uh, can you see that there's a date which has been given to all of you? Can you just see? Yes, yes, Dipsa. Uh, the second one is absolutely right. Dipsa, Savitri, uh, Ria. Ria is like, <laughs> Ria has started answering a lot. Ria, one of your answers is definitely right. One of your answers is definitely right. Okay. Perfect. I, I'm loving how most of you have actually answered the second question correctly. Now, uh, when you're talking about Foucault, Foucault's first most important work, one of the most important work is actually his doctoral thesis. This was his doctoral thesis, Madness and Unreason madness and unreason this was his doctoral thesis okay madness and unreason please remember this many a times we get confused madness and unreason this is a work of Foucault if you have read Oxford Companion to critical theory you will actually be able to get this question over there madness and unreason is the 1961 doctoral thesis okay it is subtitled as a history of madness in the classical age a history of madness in the classical age right that is a subtitle a history of madness in classical age madness in <coughs> so sorry <coughs> sorry, in classical age, right? This is his primary doctoral thesis that was there. And this was, of course, very important. It later came to be known as a history of madness in the classical age also, or simply people used to call it history of madness, okay? Uh, simply people used to call it history of madness, which I saw one or two of you had actually written about history of madness also. So please keep that in mind, madness and unreason. In 1961, madness and unreason. This is uh, like, you know, subtitled as a history of madness in classical age, history of madness, common called as history of madness this is his primary doctoral thesis this is primary doctoral thesis and you know this was one of the works that he never ever otherwise he always had problems in some of the other works of his but this was a work in which he never had any issues whatsoever okay and why is Foucault important why what is the reason that you're having uh sorry right what is what are the major re reasons that we're having uh like you know Foucault's importance because Foucault was one of the first few primary writers who was actually talking about the institutions and how these institutions are perpetuating power, how they are reproducing themselves, how, you know, you always see, like, for example, like, you know, if there is a minister, his son will always be influential. That is because they've been able to maintain power. That is because they have been able to maintain power. They have been able to perpetuate power. That has been one of the major reasons out of all the things that I remember, I always forget to take a head bath has been pending for the past past or oh, like you know almost two days anyway so so sorry about that okay because I'm, I'm looking over here and suddenly I see this and it's looking really weird anyway so here please remember when we are talking about when we are discussing about uh, like you know Foucault's works of course Foucault is very important let's let's just dive into that also I'll just uh, tell you a little bit elaborate study also because remember your uh, biopolitics is a question that has started coming there are a couple of other terms that are associated with Foucault that we'll just be discussing right now and the second one is culture and and anarchy you know what was happening Matthew Arnold was saying that there was culture but now because of democracy there is a lot of anarchy that has come to place the modern democratic world is very anarchic according to Matthew Arnold earlier everything was fine when you had a monarch but the minute democracy came in the minute democracy came in that is where un anarchy was unleashed that is when he's talking about like you know all the anarchic forces actually came into being he's talking about the fact that you know anarchy was an 
anarchy was unleashed because of the fact that you know there was this entire period where people were cribbing discussing the entire parliamentary system actually got this entire anarchic framework that is what he's talking about okay so madness and unreason is the answer for the first question and the second is culture and anarchy let's look at some points which are very very important pay attention over here now okay now when we are talking about foucault of course like i told you foucault is trying to talk about what is the relationship of power and knowledge production center okay this is something which is his major contribution foucault is saying that people in power are the knowledge creators people in power are documenting writings why do we study about the mauryan empire the gupta dynasty the harappa civilization or or like of course the harappa was not having any ruler but why are we literally looking at uh, like you know um, these kings and monarchs to be elizabethan age jacobian age carolingian period why are we not talking about ordinary people where are the ordinary people going this is something that fuku actually started his premise with and he said that the knowledge production centers have always been with the powerful people knowledge is not a political knowledge is political and it is coming within the realm of politics that is what fuku was able to understand okay so please remember yes i and we are just going to talk about biopolitics in a bit okay we are just going to talk about biopolitics in a bit which is very important so please pay attention okay yes we will be talking about hetero uh, heterotopia also uh, hafisa over here very very important all the concepts that i will just be telling you please note them down remember them as it is because these are concepts which are coming regularly these days in your paper foucault and bakhtin even if you don't study theory i would recommend all of you to at least go through foucault and bakhtin because you know these are two people which have been recurrently coming in your papers so first important thing that all of you have to understand i hope you know understand it step by step The first point that you have to remember is that Foucault is trying to talk about how there is a relationship between power and knowledge. How there is this uh, matrimony between power and knowledge. People who are powerful are the knowledge creators. Point number one. Okay. The second point: this knowledge is enabling them to reproduce their social institutions. They are able to reproduce their social institutions because of this power of knowledge that they are having. So here, Foucault was also talking about the fact that you know people are able to maintain societal con. control through institutions right they are able to maintain a lot of control so a what are we talking about that knowledge is not a political actually people in power are the knowledge producing centers the knowledge producing centers something that even the post colonial theorists like edward said will use edward said was very influenced by foucault's theories okay and the the second thing that foucault is trying to talk to us is uh, he is telling us about the fact that there is this element of social control so i hope these two pointers are clear to everyone now the most important terms that are there by Bio power. You know, for example, you must have heard, and there are beautiful documentaries. Actually, you should actually see this documentary, which is amazing. And this documentary talks about how China had introduced the, uh, like you know, the the two, uh, the, so so uh, China because of the fact that it was having a population explosion, and they wanted to control the population. So therefore, you know, they had this control over the birth that you could have. Even in India, for example, Sanjay Gandhi was very infamous um, because you know because of the fact that he wanted to bring in a lot of uh, uh, in. the sense control over the birth of children across families right uh, of course india has had schemes india has got schemes that you know uh, bachche do hi acche right uh, yeah two kids are more than enough right uh, so so that is of course so that is an example of bio power when people are trying to actually control the birth when people are actually able to control the deaths the reproduction for example a lot of countries have got laws related to abortion that you know abortion is illegal or some countries have given that okay fine abortion is perfectly legal okay so bio power is when you're trying to control the biological aspects very simply very very simply bio power is when you are able to see that people are trying to control people are trying to control the biological aspects that becomes a part of bio power all right so bio power according to foucault was basically when and on always remember foucault is always using that is the reason he is also writing discipline and punish foucault is telling us about the disciplinary nature the disciplinary nature of power power and that is how the idea of confinement also came what are jails who decides why am i sent to jail who has made the law people in power have made the law 
right uh, a very good example that for example like you know Foucault's text would actually give for example if you look at roads all right now these are our roads these are our roads whereas you'll see like you know there is a very small passage for pedestrians why is there a small passage for pedestrians who decides maybe the number of people owning a car are much lesser than the people who are walking or people who are having bicycles but still because these people who are walking are not people who are holding power and thus they are not controlling the making of laws that is the reason the roads are bigger and the pedestrian crossings are a little smaller in size and nature. So, you know, there is always this idea of control, power, confinement, discipline, punish that Foucault is actually dealing with. So, Foucault is saying that always the state wants disciplinary power. Now, imagine if this was an offline class, okay? And, uh, you know, the first thing that is said that you also look at in teaching aptitude, thankfully now it has been changing. But the first thing that it was really required in the teaching aptitude sessions was is the teacher able to maintain decorum in the class what is decorum disciplinary nature thankfully now we have come up to a realm that okay if kids are making noise that's not a sound uh, that is not a single a signal of that the kids are not learning perhaps you've made groups and uh, people are discussing in those groups and and students are learning now thankfully that trend has come but otherwise earlier teaching the first important thing was are you scared of the teacher are you like shush uh, like uh, for example when we were we were uh, growing uh, up right our teachers would say pin drop silence pin drop silence meant or finger or fingers on your lips finger on your lips right that means pin drop silence even a, a, if a drop of pin is falling down it should be heard that is how so they were trying to maintain a lot of discipline Whereas from that age, we've come to an age where people are making small little groups of students. Students are studying and interacting with each other. They're learning via group studies. They're learning via group discussions, right? So that is how we are moving out of this disciplinary control mechanism. Please understand, these are terms which are very important for Foucault. He's talking about disciplinary nature of power. If you want to control someone, you would have to have disciplinary approach. So, biopower is when I'm trying to control the bodies of people, when I'm trying to manage, when I'm trying to control the births, the deaths, the reproduction, the illnesses of a population. Now, what is what is happening, for example, today as we are speaking, okay, today as we are speaking, I cannot go and I cannot get myself vaccinated. Why I can't go and get myself vaccinated? Because the state has decided that first people who are above the age of 45 years can actually go and get themselves vaccinated in here in Delhi. Or uh, like, you know, the state has decided that first the senior citizens today, for example, the, the Supreme Court has said also that uh, everyone being vaccinated is not something that will happen in the near future. Because first of all, because of the surge in the uh, number of pe people who are like, you know, getting this infection, uh, we need to protect the vulnerable classes first. That is the elderly people first. That is people who are uh, like, you know, probably in their 50s and 60s first. So what we're able to see that, you know, I, for, for instance, God forbid, if someone who's not 45, who's below 45 is trying to like, you know, probably has got an infection and is having a respiratory problem also, uh, what are the chances of his or her survival? Who's controlling that? The state is controlling that. The state has controlled that. Okay. For example, last year, as we're speaking around the same time only, like, you know, um, when, when my grandfather, uh, he was almost uh, like, you know, ailing very badly. We're taking him to the hospital, but none of the, like, you know, we went to two hospitals they did not allow him to enter they were like no it's a covid uh, uh and, and uh, remember last year at this time it was proper lockdown across india it was really difficult so they, they denied they denied uh, like you know that you know you can't really get him because this is a covid uh hospital imagine so so that is biopower who decides like you know a patient can only enter a hospital because there are certain protocols that is biopower that is biopower the hospitals have got that power through the state so, you know, these examples are right in front of us and that is what you have to look at and that is the beauty of theory. That is actually the main beauty of theory that you have to keep in mind. Confinement is also a very important concept. Foucault is talking about the fact that, you know, through confinement, through confinement, you are able to control the society. You have actually anyone who's not listening to you. Okay, let them like, you know, get into confinement. We will get them into confinement so that they're not able to argue so that they're not able to create any ruckus whatsoever. Right. And that is what he's also trying to say. That was the birth of prison in discipline and punish. He's trying to tell you that people who want to be in power very cleverly, they created the prisons very cleverly. They created these powers to capture people.
right so what you are able to see what you are basically able to see over here i don't know whether you are able to see i just removed the bottom bar because i think that line has uh, completely gone oh what is this that has happened Okay. Anyway, uh, there are there are two screens right now. I'm just trying to uh, eliminate the bottom bar for a bit, right? So I hope now are you able to see? Uh, now are you able to see? Yeah, I I I I hope you are able to see this, right? You are able to see this or not? Uh... Absolutely, absolutely, Hafisa. All these works are examples of bio power. All these works are actually examples of bio power. You know, there there have been two screens right now that I'm having, and I'm a little confused as to whether uh, this has happened or not. Nonetheless, you'll get the PDF. Nonetheless, even if it's like you know, uh, even if the um, Uh, you are not able to see that so you know that is basically i'm just repeating the sentence he continues his studies of confinement in the history of birth of the prison in discipline and punish in discipline and punish he's telling us about the birth of prison houses people want to control people want to manage it's beautiful you know once when you start looking at foucault's writings you'll be able to understand all the things around you then another concept that has started coming is heterotopia what is heterotopia heterotopia is a term coined by foucault which is telling us that you know sometimes uh, what are our daily work uh, what are our, our social organizations your daily social organizations house is a daily social organization okay uh, then your uh, your social group uh, wherein you are studying is a, uh, is your uh, usual normal social institution these are your social groups these are your social groups and these social groups are something you know for example uh, for example if i am a student who only gets like you know a pocket money of 100 rupees per day i can probably you know i'll i can go uh, to a ccd and study if for example I'm I'm a student who's getting a pocket money of fifty rupees per day. Then I can go into a like you know a public library I, and I can go and study. If I'm a student who's probably getting like you know five hundred uh, rupees on a regular basis, then I can go to Starbucks and study. Now, can you see that my social group in Starbucks? I will make a different kind of social group. In CCD, I'll be able to make a different kind of a social group. In the library, I will be able to make a different kind of a social group. so that is basis on my class that i'm i'm literally interacting with people i'm literally interacting with people this is something that even marxism talks about that you know your base your economic base actually determines your further superstructures now these are our normal structures these are our normal structures okay we go uh, our, our houses are normal structure where we work is a normal structure but you know sometimes when we are going outside for example we are going for a holiday or for example we are going out you know for a party then that is an example of heterotopia that is an example of heterotopia that is a sphere beyond the normal that is a sphere beyond the normal whenever we are trying to move out of normal right so do remember that of course of course definitely definitely you can apply that okay you uh, you can certainly apply that uh, diksha what no ma'am what have you written i'm just coming on to the comments also don't worry okay but these are very interesting ideas these are very very interesting ideas if you actually try to analyze them if you genuinely try to analyze them yeah anubha don't worry bache what i will do is i will share the ppt with all of you then you will be able to see all of it okay so do remember that yes rabia absolutely 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 yes shubhangi right bentham was the person who gave the idea of panopticon this was a question that had come i'm just telling you this question also so very good shubhangi very good very good very good okay no way no worries no worries okay um Yeah, yeah, Aziza, absolutely. Please take care of your army. Please take care of your army. Okay, so please remember that. Okay, Rabia Singh, pin shop silence. Is it is it still there? Uh, or I don't know whether it happens or not. Okay, but please remember these are all very important ideas. So heterotopia is when I'm going away from my normal world. When I'm going away from my normal world. For example, if I'm going to trains, motels, cemeteries, or I'm going to like you know places where I don't visit on a daily basis. That is called heterotopia. that is called heterotopia where i am experiencing a different reality it is opening a doorway for me other than what happens in the normal world that is heterotopia that is heterotopia and like shubhangi said absolutely correctly right you are having the idea of panopticon panopticism and surveillance this is exactly what is happening what is the arogya setu app the arogya setu app is not only able to see whether or not i am suffering from corona virus or not but it's also able to get where am i right now am i sitting in uh, like you know am i sitting in uh, andaman and nikobar islands or am i there in uh, chinchpokle or am i in uh, like you know gadchiroli or wherever i am you know they'll be able to figure it out they will be able to figure it out and hunt me down 
that is the reason like you know your your crime patrol for instance shows that okay how are they able to pick up criminals okay let them get their call rep- records right get, get their there was a famous uh, comedian also who had done this entire play and drive okay inke call records leke aao kaha hai call records call records se hum log case sul jayenge so that is what is happening people are having the state is constantly knowing where are we the state is constantly aware imagine if i if i download an uber app what does uber say uber wants to know my location and i say a yes okay then uh, if i down- download instagram instagram wants to say okay it wants to get an access to all my photos or uh, like you know for example if i'm uh, downloading a google app google wants to know your search information so everything is gone nothing is personal at all there's no privacy whatsoever i think anyone who has a phone in today's world which everyone has right they are coming under surveillance they are being constantly watched and like shubhangi said panopticon panopticon was actually a design that jeremy bentham had given jeremy bentham the writer associated with utilitarianism that we had studied he actually had given he had actually given this entire notion like you know this design of panopticon panopticon like you know a prison where you can actually see all the prisoners so that no one es- escapes no one is able to like you know try and uh, do some sort of hanky panky and escape the prison houses the prison chambers all right so that is something that you have to keep in mind of course uh, so that is how the idea of panopticon comes in where foucault is saying that the state is constantly watching you and remember at that time the applications were not developed but see foucault was such a prescient writer he was able to imagine that you know the, the state is always having a desire to control the state is always having a desire to control you they always constantly want so you know these ideas of control the ideas of surveillance the ideas of heterotopia heterotopia is away from the normal these are all bio a uh, bio power these are all important concepts associated with foucault and the second question of course there are multiple other concepts that are there but at least keep all these uh, aspects in your mind and we'll of course continue with the discussion the second question on culture and anarchy the second question on culture and anarchy right and this particular culture and anarchy was actually actually first published in the cornhill magazine this question also comes what is matthew arnold trying to talk uh, tell us about matthew arnold is trying to tell us that you know he is this is of course the study of culture the study of education how we can go back to culture according to many people the birth of cultural studies actually happens with matthew arnold's culture and anarchy because he is giving us the idea of culture being associated with a high brow with a high brow tradition right with a high brow tradition whereas we are considering whereas we are considering right absolutely absolutely aftara sultana right kafka's the trial is also telling you about it right kafka's the trial is also telling you about it okay walikum assalam said i'm doing very well thank you so much for asking bachi okay so please keep that in mind culture and anarchy by matthew arnold is trying to tell you is trying to tell you that ever since the new democracy has come people have got a lot of uh, like you know chaotic sense people are not in proper senses whatsoever people are not in proper senses whatsoever that is what we are able to see that is what we are able to see okay now please remember that you know he is trying to associate culture with high brow tradition high brow tradition this is something that even even though you know gb shaw was writing problem plays but even in apple cart we are able to see that he also thinks that people are incapable of self governance people are incapable of self governance people are incapable of controlling themselves that is what even gb shaw was trying to talk about right uh, matthew arnold was classifying the english society into barbarians the philistines and the populans right the populans philistines and the barbarians so here he was categorizing your your working classes he was trying to categorize your uh, your uh, bourgeois classes as well as like you know your so called aristocrats into three categories into three compartments and he thought that the aristocrats could only ultimately ensure the perpetuation of culture right according to him the philistines according to him the nobility was actually having the key to culture because they could still like you know uh, get themselves immersed into cultural practices into things that were still associated with culture so to say you know the rich are able to afford the paintings of mf hussein whereas we people might not be able to do that right so that is what we are able to see that is what we are able to see he saw he was able to see he was able to tell you about what culture is how culture is basically symbolic of education how culture is symbolic of education so of course 
the deeper work are Matthew Arnold's criticism as well as Matthew Arnold's poetry. They are both very important, right? This critic's critic, right? This critic's critic is very important for both his poetry as well as for his criticism and particularly if you're preparing for your teaching exams, right? You must actually do Matthew Arnold because in both your TGT, PGT exams, Matthew Arnold is a, is a course that you have to definitely do, right? Okay, let's come on to the next questions. Uh, okay, because of time, let's look at them briefly now. All the questions, let's look at them briefly now. Question number 72 and 73. Question number 72 and 73. I will just eliminate the slides now. One second. Okay. All right. Am I... This thing is not going, is it? If I stand up. Okay, I want a pillow for my back. Tabassum Amir, Bachi, you can just call on the helpline number. They'll be able to help you out with all the things, right? Sure, sure, sure. Ayan, we'll do that. We'll definitely be do th doing that. Very good, very good, very good. Fantastic. All right. Most of you have actually given the right answer. Most of you have actually given the right answer. Uh, let's see at the classroom platform how many of you are able to answer this question. Anubha, Anand, Ria, Kanchan. Uh, all right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Rabia, Priyam, Anubha, Kanchan. Uh, <clears throat> there's Priyam, Anand, Savitri, Pooja, Rabia. All right. All right. All right. Perfect. 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 Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, so here, uh, like I told you yesterday, also, I, I had informed you when we were looking at Walter Pater that, you know, you have to definitely go through all the movements that are associated with your Victorian period. These movements actually come in your exams, right? These movements actually come in your exams, and they are directly being asked as it is. So you need to have like, you know, proper knowledge about it. The Oxford movement was basically a religious movement. Okay, it was basically a religious movement movement which was there uh, so Oxford movement has got nothing to do as such with your other aspects completely what you have to remember about the Oxford movement is the fact that it was a religious movement at the end of the day the Oxford movement that we are talking about is a movement that was religious in nature that was having religious tones attached to it right and what it wanted it wanted a religious revival in the Church of England it wanted to revive the Church of England because remember this society in another couple of years will have Charles Darwin telling them that you know that religion is not the controlling factor Bible is not telling you the reality Bible has rather to, uh, told you uh, a lie right so the Oxford movement is actually telling you the Oxford movement is actually emphasizing it is telling uh, people that you know they need to revive the Church of England and how can they revive how can they revive the Church of England as Navika rightly said by emphasizing on the Catholic heritage by emphasizing on the Catholic heritage that that is what they could do right so they were saying that you know uh, see like like we say for example um what happens when people start getting very demotivated during exams so what are you trying to say okay let's just educate people their exams at the end of the day are just testing your current preparation they're not a real barometer of how you will perform in life they are just checking the level of preparation that you have currently that is what they're trying to ace that is what they're trying to gauge right so basically when we are talking about when we are talking about oxford movement the oxford movement saw people around them being very clueless and therefore they wanted to completely revive the church of England by getting Catholic uh, practices by in, like you know by getting the Catholic uh, the, the, the sort of Catholic uh, important notions and customs so this particular movement was actually trying to renew Catholicism it was trying to revive the Catholic spirit within the Church of England right it wanted to tell that Catholic tendencies are still alive and you can still follow them all right, and you can still follow them. That is what they were trying to talk about. And of course, all of you are right, right? It's also considered to be the Tractarian movement because of the tracts that were published. You had John Henry Newman, who was a clergyman. You had, uh, you know, Mr. Fraud, who was associated, F-R-O-U-D-E. John Kebble was associated with it. So Kebble and Newman, Kebble and Newman are, uh, Newman are the two people associated with the Oxford movement, right? And, you know, these people were publishing. They were getting 90 tracts for the time published, 90 
90 tracts of the times that were published and therefore they were called as tractarians as most of you said I saw Lichi also writing tractarians so that is the reason they were writing them as tractarians so please keep that in mind all right do keep that in mind um no, Shruti, that is perfectly all right. That is perfectly all right. But the idea was to make the paper purposely tough so that you are at least not being very overconfident also about yourself. Okay, so that you're not being too overconfident also about yourself. So don't worry about it. Okay, and here Shah Nama is absolutely the correct answer. So Shah Nama is the right answer that you are having. Shah Nama is the right answer. So Matthew Arnold, Sohrab and Rustam is actually a story which is taken from the Persian mythology of Shah Nama, story of Shah that becomes the right answer that all of you can actually remember like I said the poems of Matthew Arnold are important and like I said the the prose works of Matthew Arnold both of them are important that you will definitely have to keep on your fingertip tips you can go back today itself and try to revise Matthew Arnold because you got a question related to culture and anarchy which is trying to give you a, a kind of an education it's a theory of education it's telling you about culture it's telling you about how the Philistines can actually perpetuate culture it is trying to associate culture with something that is a highbrow tradition and that's the starting point of your cultural studies also. That is the starting point of your cultural studies also. Right? Rashmi Rabat Bachri, for all the resources we've already spoken to you, right? We've already spoken to you on the Telegram channel. There are book, there are links to the videos that are there. Please check those out, right? We've already told you about the books that you can refer. Okay, let's come on to the next questions. Question number 74 and 75 and congratulations. All of you have completed 75 questions by now then. Okay, let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer very quickly. Right, what is the right answer here? Let's see the classroom platform. You know what has happened to my OBS? It's showing me two, two images. Okay, anyway. Can I? I think I've done studio mode. Oh, oh, okay. Right. Very good. Fantastic. Fantastic. I can see some of you have started answering also. Some of you have started answering also. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. I, I think we've got the answers. We've got the answers. And in the benefit of time, let's just very, very quickly discuss the answers, right? In the benefit of time, let's just discuss the answer. What is the name of, let's let's go in the backward order first. What is the name of the Utopia written by Samuel Butler? I hope you're able to recognize that there are two Samuel Butlers and both the Samuel Butlers you should actually do from your Oxford companion. That is more than enough, okay? One Samuel Butler is writing Hugh de Brass and he is coming in the 17th century. So there is one Samuel Butler, Butler that we are having. This Samuel Butler is writing a Puritan satire called Hudibras. But this is a Puritan satire, right? It is not a utopian work. It is actually a Puritan satire, which is trying to satirize the strict uh, traditions of the Puritans. But this Samuel Butler that we are having, who's writing the Utopia, is actually writing Air Worn or Nowhere. Air Worn or Nowhere by Samuel Butler, the Victorian writer, actually becomes an example of a utopian work that we are having it is becoming an example of a utopian work that we are actually talking about right that is what air one is actually trying to bring across by samuel butler it's a novel by samuel butler that we are having and in this novel by butler what we are able to see this was published around 1872 we are able to see we are able to see a place which is nowhere there it's an anagram uh, air one is actually an, an anagram for a place that is nowhere there and that is what an ideal utopia is that is exactly what we are talking about when we discuss about ideal utopias okay the first question that comes is that samuel butler's air Vaughan, what is the subtitle over the range over the range it is a utopian work it is a utopian work and what is the subtitle over the range becomes the subtitle Okay, and you know, uh, there was a question that had come. This is the only book through which Samuel Butler had actually earned profit. 
This was the only book which had made Samuel Butler earn profit. The only book through which Samuel Butler had actually earned profit. He was able to earn profit. And when you're talking about Airborne, the novel is a kind of an adventure story. Uh, it is trying to tell you about a travel that takes place in an imaginary country. And what is happening is that, you know, it is utopia because there is no uh, importance that is given to money. Money is not important here right which is so important which is so important because you know there is no purchasing if there's no money there is no purchasing value there is no purchasing value at all so that is of course one of the primary concerns now airborne has also declared a disease a crime for which like you know sick people are imprisoned so disease is a kind of a crime for which sick people are imprisoned and the crime is considered a disease for which criminals are sent to the hospital so so for example if you're suffering from cold and cough you're considered to be a, like you know a person who is a little dangerous and where are you sent what is the prison the prison is a hospital so imagine in the normal reality, it was difficult for anyone to get proper uh, hospital uh, amenities and like, you know, medical amenities. But here people who are unfit, physically unfit, they are considered to be criminals. So A, no money. B, people are criminals based on their physical fitness, based on their physical fitness. That is what you are able to see. So, you know, or, of course, there are many other things which are there. There are certain books also that you are able to see. But predominantly, predominantly, this entire work became an example of your utopian writings and Samuel Butler had also written a sequel to it in the form of Airborne Revisited in the form of Airborne Revisited so 1872 was Airborne and Airborne Revisited was in 1901 so please remember uh, Samuel Butler the 17th century writer he's writing Hudibras which is a Puritan satire and Airborne is a kind of a utopian work that we are having right it is a utopian work that we are having and here coming back to A Woman Killed with Kindness A Woman Killed with Kindness is a work by Thomas Haywood most of you actually had given the right answer for Woman Killed with Kindness it's a a play which is written by Thomas Haywood and this particular tragedy this particular tragedy uh, became like you know almost uh, like a kind of an instant bestseller also and what we are able to see in this particular work this masterpiece of Haywood uh, was actually like you know an example of middle class tragedies it was an example of middle class tragedies you were able to see that there was an element of middle class tragedies that was actually very clearly visible, that was actually very, very clearly seen, very clearly visible. So that is what we are able to see a woman killed with kindness, a woman killed with kindness was a middle class tragedy that was there. Uh, so so do remember, of course, you can actually uh, search and make notes related to domestic tragedy tradition, middle class tragedy tradition, common man tragedy tradition, because when you talk about American writings, they're also dealing with common man tragedy. For example, Arthur Miller's The Death of a Salesman is an example. It's a path breaking work an important work from your net perspective also. And that work is telling you about common man tragedies right how a common man who's a, who's considered to be an utter failure in the eyes of his two sons he's committing suicide because he, he wants his son to get the insurance money but is it even uh, like you know is it even worth an attempt that he's trying to commit suicide house for mr biswas again a common man tragedy a, a tragedy a work of failure so in the 20th century we are not having successful tales in the 20th century we are having tragic stories to tell we're having tragedies to talk about we're having tragedies to deal with okay so do remember that very good iron that's great okay so please keep these aspects properly in mind this is something that you will have to keep in mind okay all right uh, all right so let's let's very very quickly let's very very quickly take a look at the remaining questions so here you are having thomas haywood which is an example of common man tragedy so haywood is important haywood is something that you should actually be looking at right this is something that you should actually be looking at let's come on to question number 76 and 77 question number 76 and 77 what are the right answers very very quickly what are the right answers very very quickly no worries, Shubham. That is perfectly all right. What becomes the right answer? Very good. Safina has given the right answer. Safina Chaudhary was right. Uh, let's see at the classroom platform how many of you are able to answer this question correctly. Oh God, where are the classroom students gone? I mean, you guys are here only. I cannot find that page. Okay, here. Here you guys are. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Navika is saying 76. No idea. No worries at all. Let's see how many of you are uh, able to answer this question correctly. 
try and see you would be able to answer it i'm sure you will be if you if you try to look at the question you should be able to answer it correctly okay okay all right uh, i i love how navika has given the right answer uh, 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 anubha has also given the right answer shweta has given the right answer piyusha has given the right answer fantastic 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 anubha no bachche no 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 that is not the right answer that is not the right answer okay uh, who spoke uh, of the elizabethans as a giant race before blood right a giant race before blood see when you are talking about the elizabethans when you are talking about the elizabethans uh, of course uh, william shakespeare could not talk about the elizabethans because of the fact that he was not aware he himself was he was not aware that he'll be called as like you know uh, the elizabethan so to say so uh, most of you who are uh, who are talking about shakespeare that is actually not the right answer so do keep that in mind a lot of things that you know that have been said about the elizabethan age have been said either by milton or dryden a lot of it has been said by either milton or dryden okay uh, so uh, so when we talk about when we talk about the giant race in blood the giant race in blood this was actually a comment that was made by dryden this was actually a comment that was made by dryden uh, he was calling like you know the giant race before the blood that is what you were actually seeing as there's a beautiful uh, uh, there's a beautiful jstor essay by paul davies you can actually go through it if you have access to jstor which talks about the fact that you know that when you're talking about the giant giant race when we are talking about the giant race that is the word that is the word that dryden is using so giant race is actually a term that is getting used by dryden dryden is trying to use the term giant race and particularly giant race after uh, before the blood uh, that is being used giant race before the blood is being used to refer to the elizabethan so over there so dryden is the right answer dryden becomes the right answer here so giant race as a term is being used giant race as a term is being used by uh, dryden so dryden is actually talking about you know who were the giants who were the giants according to the greek mythology uh, when whenever we are talking about and that's how you are using the greek mythology see how you can even remember this you could have remembered because giants are, is a reference to the greek mythology right and giants were people who were not actually of great size giants were people who were actually having a lot of strength they had a lot of brawn b r a w n they had a lot of brawn they had a lot of physical strength and aggression right that is how they were called uh, like you know giants and giants actually had a fight with the olympian gods right they had a fight with olympian gods so imagine if people are having fight with the olympian gods that means they were having some sort of power and strength right uh, so giants is actually symbolic of the power the kind of commitment that you are having also the kind of strength and ability that you have the strength and ability that you are possessing so that is another aspect that is another point that you are able to see so who spoke uh, of the elizabethans as giant race before the blood that is dryden right that is dryden and you are absolutely right this is something that you would have actually got it on google also sir robert drury was the patron of dun he was the patron of dun i think this most of you had answered this question correctly so robert Dru Dru uh, robert drury that is the right answer he was the patron of dun uh, these are questions that you should actually be knowing and yesterday only i had asked you to look at metaphysical poetry so if you would have done your homework correctly and you would have looked at metaphysical poetry i'm sure you would have managed this kind of an answer i'm sure you would have actually managed this kind of an answer and you wouldn't have really faced a lot of problems okay so please keep all these aspects properly in mind do remember them they're all important for all of you to keep in mind the patron of dun right the patron of dun is sir robert drury sir robert drury okay let's come on to the next question question number 7 78 and 79 what is the meaning of aregopactica what is the meaning of aregopactica which was a reaction against the licensing act of 16 1643 licensing act on censorship uh, of the written material in 1644 you had aregopactica that was written dash is tobia smollett's epistolary novel dash is tobia smollett's epistolary novel very quickly what is the right answer here very very quickly what becomes the right answer here
dash is uh, let's see at the classroom platform how many of you are able to answer this question correctly oh okay and let's very quickly wrap this up also let's very quickly wrap this up also yes absolutely absolutely Sure. Which which essay? Which essay? Okay, Piyusha. Uh, Piyusha, it's a JSTOR essay. Uh, I don't know whether I can share. Anyway, I'll 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 of course do that. I'll do the needful. Don't worry about it. Okay. Very good. Fantastic. Fantastic. That is the right answer. That is the right answer. Okay. So all of you are bang on. All of you are bang on. Right. Most of you are actually uh, like you know saying the right things. Right. So when you're talking about Arigo Pactica, Arigo Pactica is actually telling us about things that are supposed to be said before Arigo Pagus. Right. Arigo Pagus. So you are having Arigo Pagus. Arigo Pagus, who's actually a Greek figure that we're talking about, and Arigo Pacticas. Uh, like you know, you have got questions related to the importance of the title. and this is something that we have actually looked at in your uh, classes itself in your 7 pm classes when we were looking at milton when we were discussing about milton that is when we have actually looked at this okay so arico pactica which is subtitled as uh, like you know a speech of john milton who was trying to talk about the uh, the prohibition that had taken place due to the licensing act right and this prose piece this non fictional prose writing was opposing the censorship opposing the licensing completely it was trying to literally act as as an important work related to the freedom of speech and expression it was dealing with the freedom of speech as well as freedom of expression that is what it was trying to look at and the title of this work the title is actually taken from the title is coming from uh, the greek right there was arico pacticos which was a speech that was written by isocrates isocrates had written this speech All right, and Arico Pagus is a hill in Athens, a hill where people actually go. Like you know, you have got these specified uh, spaces where people go and they talk about or they contest about certain problems. That is what was happening over here as well. That is what was happening over here as well. So when we are talking about, if we look at the question, if we look at the question, what is the meaning of Arico Pactica? Arico Pactica is basically meaning just go and say whatever you want to say at the Arico Pagus. you know just go and say whatever you want to say at the ario pagus at the ario pagus so this is what you have to do you have to go and say the things at the ario pagus where the things are supposed to be said you're supposed to be going and saying the things at the ario pagus that is what they were trying to talk about Okay, and dash is Humphrey Clinker. Uh, most of you have given the right answer over here, right? So Humphrey Clinker is the right answer that is there. Please remember, this is also a question that I told you yesterday itself. Uh, that you know the the novels that are coming at the beginning of your novel tradition, they are all important for all of you. You must actually have them on your fingertips. You keep on getting questions related to that, to that because remember yesterday we had looked at Female Quixote by Charlotte Lennox, and that is when I told. you that all these writings which are actually coming at the beginning of your novel writing tradition they are important from your examination perspective they are important from your examination perspective okay so please keep that in mind do remember that okay do remember that we'll actually stop over here because of time constraints but i will highly highly recommend all of you to revise all the important pointers that we've actually discussed in today's class please make sure that you're revising each and every question uh tomorrow of course we'll continue from here and there are some important things that i want to discuss in tomorrow's session okay so do remember that of course diksha i can i can definitely suggest a lot of movies we can certainly suggest a lot of movies that is something that we can surely do so don't worry about it okay so we will end the class over here uh, and we will of course continue from here itself in the next class if you have any problems do remember uh, to like you know make sure that you're sharing those doubts we'll of course continue and if there are any doubts that are unanswered you can use the grade up a doubt platform and you can mention your doubt or what you can do is that um, farhan the classes are at 3 7 and at 8 pm respectively okay thank you kirani that's very sweet of you i'll see you guys tomorrow take care good god bless